there's about three or four things that the Lord laid on my heart in this passage of scripture. And we're really reading from basically Numbers 25 through Deuteronomy chapter 9. And that was kind of the reading for the week. And the first thing I want to talk about is Balaam. We, we finished the reading last week with the story of Balaam, but his influence is felt as we go into this last portion of Scripture in Numbers in a pretty profound way. And I want to turn to the New Testament and just, just because I feel like the, the Lord is being pretty clear about warning about false prophets. Um, and I want to read a few scriptures because Balaam comes up in several places, actually, in the New Testament as an example of a false prophet. And I think we need to learn from this story because we're living in days where there's a lot of deception on the earth. And so as we're going through the Bible, if the, if the scripture and the Holy Spirit says, hey, I want you to be aware of something, we just need to think about it and uh, pray about it and, and get kind of rooted and grounded in the word. But just to kind of set the story, for, as we remember, because that was the very beginning of the week when we were reading it, Balaam, basically, um, you find out that, that there's sexual immorality taking place in the beginning of chapter 25. Um, the Israelites are tempted into idolatry and sexual immorality with Moabite women and Midianites. And ultimately, God's they go to war against them. They 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 win the war in uh, num Numbers thirty one. But what we come to find out is actually this was Balaam's advice. He actually remember he was Balak wanted him to curse Israel, but God intervened and would not let Balaam curse. In fact, he made Balaam speak blessing over the people of Israel. But Balaam thought of another way for. He thought, well, if I could get them to fall into sin, then we'll have God curse his own people. And in fact, a plague does break out. I think 24,000 are killed. Um, but Balaam's advice here was to lead the people of Israel to commit sexual immorality with the Moabite women. And so I want to turn to the New Testament uh, and just hear what, what uh, the Lord has to say to us about false prophets and some of the things that... Uh, I think Balaam exemplifies, but I want to set it in context because we believe that we're in the last days. And so the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 3, says, uh, you should know this, Timothy, in the last days will be very difficult times. People will love only themselves and their money. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They'll consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and have no interest in what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They'll act as if they're religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. They must stay away from people like that. So as we head into this conversation about Balaam and false prophetic, we need to understand the days that we're living in. And that's a pretty apt description of today. Uh, it, right down the right down the pipe, uh, the Apostle Paul nails it. But listen to this. Um, this is from Second Peter. He talks about Balaam specifically by name. He says, uh, "The Lord knows how to rescue godly people." This is Second uh, Peter two, Second Peter chapter two, verse nine. The Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while punishing the wicked right up until the day of judgment. He's especially hard on those who follow their own evil, lustful desires and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at the glorious ones without so much as trembling. But the angels, even though they are far greater in power and strength than these false teachers, never speak out disrespectfully against the glorious ones. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct who are born to be caught and killed. They laugh at terrifying powers they know so little about and they'll be destroyed right along with them. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they've done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. They are a disgrace and a stain among you. They revel in deceitfulness while they feast with you. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their lust is never satisfied. They make a game of luring unstable people into sin, and they train themselves to be greedy. They're doomed and cursed. They have wandered off the right road 
and followed the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved to, to earn money by doing wrong. It's interesting how he's named specifically. And here we're in, obviously, in Numbers, and we see this story where Peter says they love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. You might remember that story of the Israelite man who takes the Midianite woman right in front of Moses and the assembly of the people. And, and it takes the priest Phineas, grabs a spear and goes in there and kills this man who's just disrespecting and, and treating with contempt God's word, God's protocols, God's people. He's bringing that sin right in the camp. And so we see just how serious God takes sin and uh, his law and his, his, his word. And so as we read these, these stories, we too uh, should, should just be reflecting on uh, what we're seeing in our day and letting the Bible be our guide. That's Second Peter. If we turn to Jude, Jude's only one chapter long. He mentions Balaam. And he says in, in verse 11, how terrible it's going to be. It's referring to false teachers, for they follow the evil example of Cain, who killed his brother, and like Balaam, will do anything to earn money. And like Korah, they'll perish because of their rebellion. And so you can see how the New Testament authors are drawing on these stories to apply principles that were happening in their day and locate them also in the end times, as Paul did with Timothy. Um, some of these same motives that were in Balaam's heart are going to be markers for us to be aware of in the body of Christ. There's false teachers are kind of known as wolves among the sheep. They're coming in for their own profit. They, we talk about fleecing the sheep and, and wanting that profit when the gospel said, you know, freely receive, freely give. You know, Paul, when in his ministry said, like, I, I came, I worked with my own hands when I was with you. I didn't take anything from you. I gave what I had to get you. I've suffered physically for, for the preaching of the gospel. I'm in prison or I was beaten. Um, that's a that's an example of a ministry that is giving out of a place of being servant-hearted, contrasted with Balaam, who is willing to curse Israel for money, for his own selfish gain, and for his own pride and ego. And the last place I want to look at in re relationship to Balaam is in the book of Revelation. Jesus speaks of him specifically in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. And he's writing, this is in the uh, letter to the church in Pergamum. And he says, I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you who are like Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to worship idols by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. And so this is another aspect of, of the error, not just that he's greedy for money. He's somebody that's teaching others to fall away from the pure teaching of God's word. And so Balaam is held up as an example in, in this as somebody who's luring people away from the stable path. And so as you're as we're, we're all in this uh, loud, noisy season of life, there's so much happening around us in the church, in the world. There's so much deception. The love of many is growing cold. Sin is rampant everywhere. There's obviously there's wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation. There's some in intensity around us and we have to use the discernment of the Holy Spirit to uh, identify and stay true to his word and to and be aware of influences around us uh, at every turn. So just wanted to Hit that before we move into Deuteronomy, because it's a theme in the, in, in that we read about here as we end the book of Numbers. But I just felt like the Lord was saying to me, you know, just touch on this, because it's not taught very often. We don't hear a lot of direct teaching about the false prophetic, but Balaam really is a consistent example of that for us to reflect on. So the second thing I wanted to talk about is it actually in, in the book of Deuteronomy. This is the second telling, the second giving of the law. This is a retelling of the story. They're talking about what's happened, putting things in context. This is where we were. This is what happened. This is when you were uh, committing idolatry. I interceded for you. Moses is saying to the people of Israel, he's kind of giving them the state of the union before they take the promised land. 
but there's an interesting series of scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 7 that I think reveals something about God and his relationship to Israel. And this answers the question, why did God choose Israel? Um, he answers that question for us in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. Number one, he says, uh, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest nation on the earth. And I chose you, in fact, because you were the smallest and the weakest. It's interesting. I think the idea is that the nations would look on and say, they're not, they're, they're not a huge nation. They're not militarily advanced. There's no other explanation for their blessing and their success, except that their God is greater than our gods. And I think in that way, Israel was to be a provoking mechanism to the nations surrounding them so that they would understand that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the reason why Israel was as successful and as blessed as they were. And so if he chooses the smallest and the weakest, then his glory is expressed at its most optimum and most, and it's maximized, if that makes sense. And so he chose them because they were small and weak so that his strength and his glory would be maximized. But he says, I also chose you because I love you. I love that. God is being faithful to his promise that he made to Abraham. And he says, for the sake of the covenant I made with Abraham, for the patriarchs, for your fathers, your ancestors, I, I am demonstrating my loving kindness and my faithfulness to you. And so why did God choose Israel? It wasn't anything that, that in, in, in Israel in and above itself, except that God is being faithful to perform his word and his covenant. That lays the foundation for us all, the Abrahamic covenant. And so he says some interesting things following on into Deuteronomy chapter 8, and they're again putting in perspective their experience to this point, these 40 years. I want to read the beginning of uh, chapter 8, the first five verses. And the Lord says, be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you grow hungry and then feeding you with manna of food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. I love these verses. Lessons in the wilderness, you know, as these children of Israel are wandering, God is restating some things he's taught them over these 40 years. Number one, he's taught them humility. He is working on their character. He just, as a, as a parent disciplines a child, he's disciplining and weaning Israel. You know, we've talked about before, you can get the person out of Egypt, but getting Egypt out of the person is a different process. And so Israel had no culture when they left Egypt. All they knew was uh, a slave mindset. All they'd known was abuse and oppression. So God, through this 40 years, he's teaching the generation that's going to be going in to the promised land. He's preparing them. He's preparing their character. And humility is a large part of that. He says he tests to reveal their character to see if they would really obey. And so he says, I, I intentionally caused you to grow hungry. They were dependent on manna. And so every day they had to get up. And if the manna wasn't there, they would die. And so God was teaching every day just how necessary he was to their survival and their dependence. And he warns them later. He says, you know, when you go in and you're blessed and you're going you're gonna to have vineyards that you didn't plant and you're going to live in houses that you didn't build and you're going to go to cities that you didn't construct, don't forget who I am. Don't forget that, that it's me. I'm the reason why you're able to acquire this land. And, you know, he is actually judging the people that are in this land. And he himself says, you're not better than the people that you're going to be removing. 
but I'm going to use you as, as a mechanism to judge the nations that are in the Canaanite lands right now because their sin is right. And so it's not, you're not getting this because you're better than them. You know, I'm walking with you and I'm being faithful to the word I, uh, that I said to Abraham. Um, so don't forget. And we have that concept again so often, over 200 times that the word in the Bible, remember. Don't forget what God did. And so Moses is charging Israel many times in Deuteronomy. Remember what God has done. Remember the lessons we've learned. Remember to obey him. Remember to follow all of his commands. He wants to bless you. And here's the, we're going to see it at the end of the book, but there's all these blessings that God wants to give. He wants to have his people walk in life and blessing. And he says, and here's the curses that are going to happen if you disobey. Choose life. I set before you life and death. Oh, that you would choose life. And that's God's heart. He doesn't delight in the punishment of the wicked. But he, he, there is judgment that will come. And so he's testing. There's, he's teaching them humility, their character. I love this phrase that says, uh, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And we can hear, this is Jesus quoted Deuteronomy more than ever, any other book in the Bible. And so when he's being tempted in the desert with Satan, this is his spiritual warfare manual. He's quoting Deuteronomy to combat Satan's direct temptations of him in the, in the wilderness. You know, Satan, if you remember the temptation, you can just, if you really are the son of God, just turn these stones into bread. You've heard it said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word comes from the mouth of God. And so here we have the foundations of there's nothing more important in our life than every word that's coming from God's mouth. He's the one that sustains. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says the entire universe is upheld by the word of his power. God spoke. He created everything that could be created. We know that Jesus is the word. John chapter one, the word was made flesh. The word was with God. The word is God. And his word sustains, creates and sustains everything as upheld by the power of his word. And so God is teaching Israel and he's teaching us likewise how much we need his word in our lives every day. And so my last thought um, to share with you guys is just uh i'm gonna it'll be on tomorrow's breadcrumbs too but i just wanted to restate it um how important story is you know god as a storyteller um and part of what's happening here is they're recounting the narrative of everything they've been through and the storytelling is universal it doesn't matter what culture or tribe human beings are narratively oriented in our hearts jesus told parables in his teachings. Think about all the, all the stories, books, films, uh, just storytelling around the campfires back in the day before there was any technology. Human beings, we love to tell stories and we love to develop plots and draw themes. And so God is the ultimate master storyteller. The Bible is given to us in story form from Genesis through Revelation. It's one story of God's master meta narrative on how uh, mankind has fallen, but how he's redeeming, restoring mankind. And so as we think about Israel as a story, you know, sometimes believers may be like, well, what, this is, I just, what does this have to do with me? I'm reading about Israel. What does it have to do with me? And I want to lay out a few thoughts about why it matters. Um, not saying that anyone on this call is saying that, but there are entire denominations. The reason I think this is important, there, there's entire denominations that are saying the Old Testament, you can just do away with it. It's, it's really true. I've heard some teachers teach that the, all that matters is the red letters of Jesus. And I always say like, well, that's okay if you realize that his red letters, he's quoting the black and white letters of the Torah so often. And if you have no idea what's in the Torah, you're not going to understand what Jesus is actually talking about. And so it's not okay to come in in the New Testament. Uh, you're kind of coming in the middle midpoint of the movie. You don't know who the characters are. If you started in Matthew chapter one, it's going to be this genealogy of Jesus's family line, but you don't know who any of those characters are or why they matter. And why is this, why does this genealogy even significant? 
The only reason you would know that is if you started at the beginning of the story and, and walked all the way through and understood who Jesus was as the Messiah, the son of David. And so from a uh, one one reason this is this is a significant story is just a, it's a historical narrative of a real people, real place, real time, real events. And so this really happened. And this is, you know, the Bible says we can learn from this. All scripture is good for teaching, re rebuke, reproof, training. That's written in the New Testament. But of course, there was no New Testament at that time. And so the author is saying, think the old he in, in his mind is the Old Testament. And so these are lessons and uh, events that are instructive to us and how God wants to walk with us. We've already talked about in the book of Hebrews how the author there is saying, you know, don't make the mistakes of the children of Israel uh, in their wanderings, the, the generation that died out, you know, don't make those same mistakes. And so he's drawing on this very narrative to instruct Hebrew believers of his day to avoid some of the same pitfalls that Israel fell into in their 40 years wandering. So it is a historical narrative for sure. Um, and it's valuable for us to understand that narrative. Uh, it's also a family prophetic history. If you believe in Jesus, um, and you put your confidence in his blood and the salvi his salvific work in your life, you are, by faith, you are included in the children of Abraham. That's what, when God said to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, that's going to include every tribe and tongue. We know that from Revelation chapter 7. And so the gospel is now extended out. It was never just going to be an Israel-centric story. It begins with Israel. But the commonwealth of Israel expands and nations are grafted in to God's covenantal work through the blood of Jesus. And so this is our family history. You know, I think in the West, we, 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 we hear a, uh, a very individualized gospel presentation. You're a sinner. God loves you. Jesus died. He forgives your sins. And one day you'll go to heaven. And you won't, you won't go to hell. None of that's false. But there's just it's it's missing key uh, portions of truth and context. You know, you are saved as an individual, but you're saved into a family. You know, this story, you're saved into a story. When you, we're, we're brought into community uh, as God's sons and his daughters. And so the story of Israel is the story of the family of faith. And what, whatever tribe you come from, you're grafted into this story. So it works as a family prophetic history. It's also a the story of Israel is a metaphor for humanity. It works on that level too. Uh, we were not personally in Egypt enslaved to experience what uh, the Jewish people experienced uh, in Egypt. But you and I both know what it means to be a slave to sin. We weren't wandering through the desert for 40 years, but we're wandering between where, we're, where we were at and where we're going. Um, we're taught to view our lives as pilgrims, as be sojourners, as strangers passing through, living in tents. And that was what how Abraham lived. And again, Hebrews says that's how we need to live, just like Abraham did. Live in tents. These are temporary dwellings. This body is temporary. It's passing away, as the Apostle Paul says. And so we may not have been in the story uh, then, but we are, we certainly can relate to these universal themes. We have a, a destination and a hope. Just like Israel was moving towards the promised land, we're moving towards the new Jerusalem. And so the story of Israel in, in Deuteronomy and in the Torah we, is universal and we can relate to it, all of humanity. You know, if God is true to Israel, he'll be true to every tribe and tongue. And this is a narrative a foundational stone that's being set for faith. Faith that God is true to his word, faith that his character and his nature is good, and, and it's uh, the path that he's laid out for us to walk as we place our faith in his ultimate provision, which is his son, Jesus Christ, who makes all these things available for us. So those are my some of my general takeaways from uh, Numbers 25 through Deuteronomy 9, and would love to hear your thoughts on some of the questions that I posed at the front.
in Deuteronomy 6, the verse that says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. And I mean, that is the, that is the greatest commandment that Jesus Christ himself reiterated in the New Testament for us. But here it is for the first time that it's told to us to love the Lord your God with all your heart. But I like the part that's added after it. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly. You have to be intentional to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. Like we, this is part of like where Jesus said you must die to yourself, you know, daily. Because we have to be committed to follow him. And the world is waging against that, you know, and vying for everything but that from us. Um, so I just think it's important for us to remember that today that we wholeheartedly need to be committed and understand um, that we're called to it and that it's even, again, a reminder that it is indeed the greatest commandment. Well, a couple of things I, that I took away from numbers that really jumped out at me that I'd never really processed too much. The holiness of God really came out and the sinfulness of humanity. So there, there are a lot of foils for me. The necessity of obedience to Yahweh as he, he presented and named himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the tragedy of, of disobedience to Yahweh's commands when, when they would disobey, and the utter faithfulness of God to use his covenant agreement with Israel. Just how God is organizing Hebrew slaves into a unified community of God prepared to fulfill their covenant obligations. And it's just a lesson to us, I think, for me, is how am I going to fulfill, you know, my, my obligations. Jesus did it on the cross. Absolutely. He did, but I also have a part um, because he is holy. I want, I want to be holy. I, I want to agree with that. I want to be in this ascent in relationship with him. I want to be teachable. Um, I want to serve a holy God and I want to be holy as he is holy. Brought out, it was a mirror that brought out my sinfulness um, my mumbling, my griping, my complaining, and when I should be, you know, in thanksgiving and rejoicing, my disobedience, when I overlook it, because we're in the West, we're so spoiled. Everything seems to wrap around me, myself, and I, even when we try for it not to be. It's all about he, himself, and him. I've just been overwhelmed with the faithfulness of God um, in, his, in his wanting to bless us and choosing life and not death and blessings and not curses. And how I do that rolls out in my walk. Out of, out of my mouth comes the issues of my heart. How am I ministering to people? How am I representing holiness to others? How am I, how am I really being holy as he is holy and not picking up that yoke of bondage to slavery again, but just wanting to be intimate and to, to have that High, the highest relationship, the, the most important thing in my entire life, more than my husband, my son, my ministry, any kind of possessions, but it's all about him. So I've been able to take this new revelation. You know, Pastor Sylvia was talking about how much she loved numbers, and it really ignited a fire in me to go back and really dive deep. And there's a new fire in my bones. So that's, that's kind of my takeaway. Love what you said, Jackie, about the faithfulness of God. And, you know, when you think about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, the word obedience isn't in there. It's interesting. I was praying about it one day, and I'll share this with you just because I feel like what you said so key. God is basically saying, uh, he's giving the law, and he's wanting Israel, he's wanting us to be like him to think like he thinks, to act like he acts, to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And so why is an obedience a fruit of the spirit? And, um, you know, I, I was praying about it and I just felt the Lord show me, you know, you could be in the army, your commanding officer could tell you to clean the latrine and you could obey and do it, but you could hate your commanding officer while you were doing it, but you wouldn't be faithful if you hated him in your heart. And so faithfulness is the idea of children and their parents, you know, like the, 
contrast that story with like a, a father who has a ranch and they're out working the ranch. A lot of work has to be done. His sons are out doing different work. And the father sees that a fence has to be mended somewhere. They come home for dinner. And he's going to tell his son to take care of the fence. And he, they're having dinner and his son, and he says like, Hey, Hey, you know, I, I saw this fence on the Southwest corner needed to get fixed. And the son's like, I saw it earlier. I took care of it, dad. Oh, well, pass the gravy, you know, praise the Lord. Um, this, the son knows what's in his father's heart and has ownership of and stewardship of the father's creation. And they're sharing the work together. And so you just see him, you know, Jesus, as he's moving through life, his, the faithfulness he had, he knew he didn't have to pray and ask the father if, if, if that guy was going to be healed on the Sabbath. Of course, this is the father's will. He knows his father. And that's what I believe is happening in the giving of the law is that the Lord is, he just said it. We read it in Deuteronomy 8 that I disciplined you like a father would discipline his children, that you would have my heart, that we could walk through life and steward these things together. And so I love that idea of, the, of what you said, Jackie, about faithfulness and how God wants to build that in us, in our own walks with him, you know, right now as, as disciples of Christ. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor Jed. Um, I'm always excited when you show up. I don't know why, but I thank God uh, for the wisdom that he's giving you. But so far, uh, the two themes that I got from this, uh, from the book of Deuteronomy that I, I felt was a tremendous blessing, was God essentially uh, giving us the difference between the laws of freedom and the laws that keep you in bondage. Now, it's amazing because the children just came uh, from, um, from a place where they were in bondage. And what were the laws uh, that kept them in bondage? The people that were over them believed in slavery and, and, and enslavement that really tormented God's people. And uh, if you take the spiritually, so we ought, we ought to ask, like, what, uh, what uh, 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 belief systems were these people under that kept God's people in bondage? Well, God takes them out of that system and gives them a clear contrast. I'm giving you laws of freedom. And I, and I believe uh, one of the things that uh, catches me about the book of Deuteronomy is every law, of course, that we know God gives is, is good. It's good in its very nature. And it, it's, its purpose is to keep us uh, uh, healthy, happy, prosperous, and, and, and obedient to God when we do those things. So uh, essentially, what I get from this is, is the laws of freedom and God letting his people go through all of that to give them just a clear, clear contrast. And it is sad because uh, as I began, as I continue to read, I see that the people don't lend their lesson. I don't know if it's that they don't get the fact that what enslaved you were the laws of sin. And I'm giving you the, the direct opposite to keep you uh, in freedom and, and in joy and in peace and in, in happiness in my presence. So that is what I, I really got from this, uh, uh, from this um, uh, book, the book of uh, uh, um, uh, um, Numbers. Um, so it, it was really a blessing for me. Thank you so much. Amen. I would say that, and not a surprise, but just a reinforcement. And in Deuteronomy 4, it says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your father gave you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Again, it re-emphasizes to me that God's desire is to teach us that we may learn his ways, his statutes, commandments, and decrees, that we may understand the very heart of God. I rejoice in the patience that God takes because he re-emphasizes, he reiterates the things over and over again. He's not a God that says, let me say it once, and you get it real quick, and if you don't, you're going to miss it. But he said, look, I'm going to be patient, and I'm going to tell you the same thing over and over again. And if you quite didn't get it the first time, let me tell you the second time, and let me look at a different angle so that you can get it. I love that because, in essence, God is saying that, that 
We have different levels of intellect and intelligence, but he loves all of us equally, and he wants to make sure that we get clear understanding. And because of his deep love for us, he meets us right where we are. And we see that through Numbers, Deuteronomy. I think we see it in all of Scripture. But in particular, I'll stay where we are today. I read the Word of God and see that, you know, um, I don't have to have a PhD because God can speak to me at the level in which I am and cause me to understand because he really do want us to get this. And then the other thing is all of what Jackie said and more, and even Jack, what you said, I agree. Uh, obedience is not one of the fruit of the spirit, but I believe having served in the military, and I remember when I was a private, and they said, take the toothbrush and clean the toilet. I didn't love anybody, didn't like what I was doing, and but I was obedient. But when I began to understand, because they became a family, you know, training as a private is different than a permanent part of relationship, because that's what I see all in the word is relationship. So when I begin to understand that maybe the things that they were asking and the standards were a little strict, but it wasn't because they just wanted blind obedience. It was to safeguard. It was to protect. It was to teach me so that I could know what was right and wrong and acceptable in that family. And in doing so, it would go well with me. I would prosper, get promoted, and move up the ranks. And then as a result of that, I begin to understand they really care. And so much more it is with God. God is telling us these things because he loves us. And I believe the byproduct of the fruit of the spirit is once I get them and I understand this great love, that's what enables me to obey. People tell me all the time, well, you know, I don't want to do anything because I'm obligated. And I got to do it for God. I do nothing out of obligation. I do everything because I love him because he first loved me. When I read this, I see the love of God over and over again. I see that he set out these things, knowing that I couldn't do it on my own. Because when I read these words, these scripture, God isn't saying, Sylvia, you do it. He's saying, it's a partnership. I know you can't, but with me, you can. And I'm going to do it with you. I am here. And we're going to do this thing together. I'm going to teach you along the way. I'm going to bring understanding. I'm going to bring clarity. When he was giving this, he was sharing what it takes to be holy. But knowing full well, there is not a man, woman, boy, or girl that can do that on their own. But with him, we can do it because he is and he will cause us. He will bring us and he will be patient and loving as we go every step of the way. So in this, what I see over and over again is this great love that he has for us and that he wants us to be holy and distinct, separated and apart from the rest of the world so that we can walk in the fullness of him. I can do nothing by myself, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to say one other thing. Pastor Jed, you were talking about understanding the Old Testament and how it defines the New Testament. And I just found it really interesting in Acts chapter seven. I was reading about Stephen's dissertation with the Sanhedrin and that entire chapter. It just talks about, you know, the first five books of the Bible. And it goes on. Um, he's Stephen right before he's stoned. He says, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and re revealed in it. They're what their own hands had made, but God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Raphan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Then on down, 
Stephen quotes and says, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made these things? You stiff-necked people. Then he goes on and on. And of course, he's stoned. And while they're stoning them, he looks up and Jesus stands up. You know, and of course, Paul or Saul observes. But that's just, I think, such a powerful testament um, to what you were talking about, Pastor, about, you know, we have to understand the Old Testament to be able to understand the New Testament. Absolutely. And it's such an important point. I don't know if people know this or not, but in the Jewish tradition, you're taught to speak Hebrew by reading the scripture. So most Certainly, certainly men in, in the ancient world, most men would have had about 80% of the Old Testament memorized. A guy like Paul would have had 100% memorized. And there's this rabbinic uh, method called remez. And it basically, it means hint. And so when, the, when a rabbi would teach, he would, you've heard it, you know, Jesus said, you know, you've heard it said, and he's referring to scripture. But in the mind of the audience, I'm expecting you, if I'm the rabbi, I'm expecting you, when I say you've heard it said in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, and I'll go on to make my point, I am expecting you to bring the entire chapter in context of your understanding with me so I don't have to read the whole chapter to you. I can assume that you know the whole word there, and we can, it'll, it'll streamline our conversation because I won't have to read everything to you. If that makes sense. And so, you you know, to your point, a guy like Stephen is walking them through their entire history and he <laughs> he steps on some toes uh, there in, in Acts chapter seven. But, you know, God was certainly glorified. But I just think it's important what you said that, you know, it we we can look back and think we're so sophisticated now compared to then. But I think it's actually the opposite. When Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, I believe that's the West. You think you're rich, but you're poor. You're, you think you're well-dressed, but you're naked. Uh, you think you see, but you're really, you're blind. So come to me. I'll wash your eyes. I'll dress you. And I'll, I'll give you gold and find the fire. Like, I love that about Jesus, that he's not, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't let our spiritual condition, he doesn't condemn us. It's an invitation to come to him. He said the same thing to the Pharisees, by the way. He says, you think he holds up the scripture, right? He says, you think in this scriptures, you have life, but these testify of me. Come to me that you may have life. And I think that's the whole call of, of God's heart for all of humanity throughout the scriptures. And we see it on even on the bread for the journey, the, the quote that Krista has, whoever's thirsty and hungry, come buy food, drink milk. It's free. This is a free gift of God is word. And so I, I love what you said, Jackie. It's so key. And what was inside, you think about the first 3,000 people that were saved in Pentecost. These are Jewish guys. They're in Jerusalem for the Feast of Shavuot. They're your, you're your small home group leaders. They're in each other's homes. They get saved. Think about how great the Bible teaching must have been when they have 80 to 100% of it memorized and it's in their, in their hearts and in their mouths. And now they have the understanding of who Messiah is. They can tell you who Jesus is because he's throughout the Old Testament. But Jeff, you bring up a very, very interesting point. And what you just said is that, you know, in, in essence, uh, the ordinary people would have memorized 80% of it or more. Uh, and we today have been given the entire 66 books. How much do we take advantage of that in reading so that we can have the full understanding? You know, there is no one in, I don't believe, but maybe there are, so I'm going to go back and take that back, that most people do not buy a novel and start in the middle and say, I know exactly what the author meant. I received the whole story. This was the best book ever because I didn't need the other 250 pages, just the last 250. Most don't do that. Most don't go to the end of it and say, I'm going to read just the end and I will understand. 
But why do we choose the word of God? And it's unfortunate. If God did not deem it was necessary, he would have given us all 66 books. He gave them all so that we would understand the fullness and the, and the entirety that the book represents. Not the entirety of God, because he's still teaching, he's still leading, he's still revealing. But this, every one of the chapters is profitable and it is needed. Because if you don't know, and there's an old adage that says, if you don't know where you came from, how will you possibly know where you are going? So if we only focus on, I'm going to read the uh, New Testament and not the old, you cannot have the full story and the full understanding of what God did on day one and what he's continuing to do now. Now, I'm not going to uh, point the finger at anyone, but I remember that uh, I was in training and we were doing some training and I had a pastor that told me and she, she said it to me, you know, you only need the, the um, you only need to know what is in red because that's what Jesus said. And I sit there and went, whoa, people are in trouble. Because, Jed, I don't know about your book, Bible or Krista, but none of mine is in red. Amen. <laughs> I don't have that. Mine is all in black and white. So if I only need to memorize and read what is uh, outlined in red, I'm in trouble. Amen. We need to know every single dot, every thing that is written, because God put it there for a specific reason. And if we do not know fully, that's why we must get the word in us. You started out saying we're in the last days. Well, in the last days, deception is going to increase. And if you don't know an apple from an orange, someone will tell you that you are, that you're buying a orange and they call it an apple. You must be able to discern the truth from the lie. And that is why God gave us his word. So I tell people, we need to love the word of God. I think you said this earlier when you were saying the weapon that Jesus used was the word. It was the book of Deuteronomy. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. I believe that if we spend more time telling the enemy what is written, we will just see him defeated because the word will defeat him as compared to in my own strength, in my own understanding. We must, it's imperative, it's imperative. Get the word in you. Pray that write it on my heart, write it on my mind that I may know it so that I can distinguish the truth from a lie. Because here's the flip side of that coin. The things that Satan challenged him with, if Jesus was not the word and didn't know the word, it came from the word itself. He just distorted it. And Jesus counteracted with the very truth of the word of God. We must know the truth so that we can defeat the lies because we are living in a day and time in these last days where lies, false prophets you were talking about, is running rapid. And how will I know that it's a lie? If I don't know the truth, we must know the truth. Amen. Well, you know, I want to just confirm that with scripture. One of the points that you made about all scripture um, being uh, profitable for us, but not only that, that it's the inspired word of God. You know, so we are supposed to listen to the words of Jesus, but Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the word. He inspired every bit of it, everything that was written in this book. If God can sling the stars across the sky and create the universe, could he uh, cause certain books and certain scriptures to come together and be held collectively throughout all of these thousands of years? Of course he can, because he's God and he's sovereign and he intended and purposed to do it and he did it. But in 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, it says, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding. So it never came from just their head. They're not making this up. That's what the word says. Or from human initiative. They didn't even want to do it. 
It ha it's saying that it wasn't even their own initiative to do it. It says, no, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. So this is the inspired, God-breathed words to us. And this is why, to the point that everyone's making here, it is truly so important that we read it cover to cover. So just reminded me, Krista, I meant to do this earlier, but this is a great place to do it. A little segue. Um, I don't know if you can see that. This is a little book called Unlocking the Bible, written by a guy named David Pawson, British. Very good Bible teacher. Uh, what he does... That's my absolute favorite. I have to just plug that endorsement with you. Um, uh, this will help you if you want to order it off Amazon or whatever. Um, he goes through every book, sets it in its context. Look, Chris has got her copy there. Um, when it was written, who wrote it? Who was the audience? What are the meta themes, narratives? Kind of gives the 50,000 foot flyby of each book of the Bible. Um, and so we probably should have done this in week one, but this is a great accompaniment to what we're doing. If you are interested, I, I really recommend Unlocking the Bible, David Pawson. It looks like Krista is a second, the second confirming witness. I'm sure Sylvia is probably too, but um, this, could, this could also be a good companion to what we're doing together. Uh, this is actually Doug Robertson, Cindy's Roberts, uh, Cindy Robertson's husband, who I sit in with her and, and listen uh, every week. But what I was, I learned... And this last reading it is Balaam was the was kind of the root of have, having the Israelite people, men, marry intermarry into foreign women. And th so that's what kind of what I learned is, is Balaam was behind that. And then I was I was surprised that Moses was allowed to have a foreign wife especially since it was such a crucial tool in turning the Israelites away from God. And it would seem to me be a, a, a poor example for all the people who looked up to him. And so that challenges, and evidently that was okay with God because uh, they never said anything that was derogatory or God didn't reprimand him for anything. So that challenges me to search the scripture and the Holy Spirit to find out another character of God to find out, you know, why was that not a problem? That would, that would seem to me to be a real serious problem, but evidently it wasn't. So I'm challenged to search the scripture and find out if I can, why that was. Awesome. Uh, there's a mysterious verse. You might remember it. If it, I can't, I'll have to look it up exactly to find the address, but <laughs> Moses hasn't circumcised his sons yet. And his wife, Zipporah, comes and does it and throws their foreskins at Moses' feet and calls him a bloody bridegroom. And it said the Lord was going to kill Moses. Right. It doesn't say much else, but it says he's going to kill him. And so I think it's in, kind of implied there that, that Moses, we don't know all that's going on, but, but he hadn't yet had his own household commit to the covenant of circumcision. And it may have been his wife. There may have been a disagreement there where she didn't want it done. And Moses didn't do it because of her. And so she finally realized that God was going to kill him. And so she relented and did it herself. Uh, it's just an interesting story. But I think there were some problems there um, that Moses had to contend with within his, within his, own, within his own family. Okay, yeah, thank you. That helps because, yeah, you're right. He did have some problems you know, previously. I mean, when it says the Lord's going to kill you, that's, uh-oh. And your wife circumcises and throws it down at your feet. That's pretty serious. Yeah, that's a drastic uh, move. You don't see that on Sunday school. Most, <laughs> no, most, most days in church. <laughs> but can I can I add Thank something you. here too? And again, it's food for thought. And food for thought would be perhaps because the law itself was not written. Moses took the wife before God gave the actual law. If we go back and we look at that, he also talks about you're not to marry your sister, whether she is the uh, daughter of your father or of your mother, it's not to be. But Abraham married Sarai, and we know he falls into that category. Also, if you look at Joseph, Joseph had also married someone that was a foreign wife, a foreign woman. So perhaps it was because, again, the law was not written. But also Paul says this, 
Paul says that if you come in the New Testament, if you are married and you become saved, but you are not saved or your husband and your wife, you're not supposed to leave your husband and wife once you become saved. You ought to stay with them. Amen. Because how do you not know that your witness your walk with God will not save them. And in that union, your children are holy. So again, we have to also look at the context. You know, Paul even addresses that. He says that when there was no law, then, you know, the grace is implied. But when the law came, the law is what taught him what right and wrong was. So Moses married her while he was in Midia. He hadn't been called to come. Did God know what his destiny was? Absolutely. But Moses did not. And he hadn't stepped into that office. But once he stepped into the office, coming into the fullness of his destiny and purpose, now the standard is different and the law is given. But here's the thing that I would say, uh, Sylvia, in addition to what you're saying, the, the, the covenant of circumcision goes back to Abraham, and we know Moses chose, it says in Hebrews, he, didn't, I did, he, he chose not to uh, indulge the fleeting pleasures of sin in Egypt, but he identified with the suffering of the Israelites. And so the law hasn't been given yet, but the covenant of circumcision had, and he knew now, about it. And I think there's something there where they're at this lodging, and it said, just says the Lord comes and is going to kill him. And then the next thing we have is the Zipporah is uh, is circumcising the kid. Um, so I don't know. And the, the 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 it gets into the idea of what what why the circumcision is such a big deal. And I think it has to go to you know Jesus is bring, or the Lord is bringing about the promised seed. So the circumcision is the consecration of the member through which that work is going to be brought about. And so intermarriage and sexual relations are such a big deal when it comes to um, God's working with this covenant people to bring about the Messiah. Um, and so I think the fact that Moses hadn't yet done that was something that the Lord was dealing with him on. But I agree he, with you yeah. wholeheartedly. And I wasn't addressing the the point of the circumcision. I was addressing in reference to how and why God did not say anything and defended him in reference to the wife that he married. Because yeah. truly, uh, Miriam and Aaron had a problem with it and God calls them out and she ends up with leprosy. I get that. Uh, and But I agree with you in that Moses had failed to circumcise his sons and God was not pleased with that. And he would not allow him to stand before his people and not be right in that regard. But I also want to bring out another thing that might just be food for thought. When, you know, she's a Midianite uh, and her father was a priest, but how does she know how to circumcise? You know, I have a son. I saw the circumcision. I've, I have some grandsons. You know, she knew precisely how to do it. So maybe it even goes back further than that. And that is when we begin in the book of Exodus itself, when it talks about that, you know, um, when the Pharaoh himself had told the midwives what they were to do with those male children, and they did not do that. I think we're pretty confident because if they couldn't eat at the table with Joseph, then it probably was not Israel. It was probably not Egyptian midwives bringing the Hebrew children into life. Uh, let's just say that. And you know, the Hebrew women maybe, but maybe it was a different nation, and maybe that nation is a a and. And Moses' wife, Shapora, Shapora, I'll be want to say her name. Perhaps she was a descendant of those midwives, and she knew exactly what to do. And that's mm. why she was able to perform that circumcision with the flint, which is a rock that was sharp from the ground, and she did it with precision. Man, thanks, Sylvia. Go ahead, Quincy. Yeah, hey everybody. Sorry, um, a little late, but um uh, actually, when when uh, I forget his name, when he was asking the question, um, uh, I thought he was 
I thought he was referring to the um, the the instance where uh, Aaron and, and Miriam had come to Moses and said, "Hey, you you've taken this wife. Is this still Zippor at this point, or is this another? Was this uh, uh did, I don't know what happened to Zippor, but did she pass away? Was this another? Was this another wife? Because it calls her. Uh, I think it calls her a Cushite or something like that. The Bible does not address her passing away. And it doesn't yeah, yeah. say that he married another woman. Okay, but do you know do you know of that you know do you know where that scripture is when when they give the description of, of the wife? This, the, because I I knew I, I, of course I know about Zippor and I knew about the um the circumcision. Moses kind of continues on his trip. And then I know about when the the father in law brings Zippor to Moses and gives the account of all that God had done, you know, in Egypt and, and brings his children. And then later on, we see again, uh, you know, it comes up that Miriam and Aaron rose up against Moses about, but it doesn't say Zippor. So I guess we, you know, of course, we just assume that it's, that it is Zippor, but it calls her, I think it says a Cushite or something like that. I just pulled up a commentary on what you're saying, and it is a good point. Um, and I think everyone is on the right path here because what this commentary says is that the Bible doesn't say much about Moses's wife, Zipporah. We know she was a daughter of a man called Jethro, who was a priest. The Bible does not explicitly say that Moses had more than one wife. However, Numbers 12.1 leads many to surmise another wife because Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. So the number, right. the question of the number of wives, it says it hinges on the identity of this Cushite or Ethiopian woman. Is this reference to Zephora or is this another woman? So that's Bible commentary, meaning that there's obviously lots of people who are questioning that. So I think it's a fair yeah. question but that we might not have an answer to um, unless we just continue to search the scripture and see something else revealed that maybe some others aren't finding. But yeah, and the only reason why, I've, you know, I you know, I thought like this is because they make it very, the scripture is very clear in saying that Jethro was a, a Midianite. So of course his, his daughter, you know, you know, we would think is also Midianite. So then why is the distinction of calling uh, the wife a Cushite? And then why are they all of a sudden now upset with Moses about a wife that had been there the whole time? Actually, even before Moses even traveled to to Egypt to meet Aaron, he was already married to um, Zippor. I think it is all good things. And basically, none of the commentaries come to a extensive conclusion. You can mm. look at others that will tell you that it is the same wife. It's gotcha. not in, it's not conclusive. It's inconclusive. So we can read it any kind of way. And you can ask that question, you know, but also I would say Quincy is when they started on the journey, they weren't jealous of Moses. When I right. become jealous and upset with somebody, then I become jealous and upset with their wife, their kids, their grandmama, yeah. their daddy's mama, everybody else. But as yeah. long as we walk it in harmony, I might not have a problem with your wife. But when I start thinking that God is paying more attention to you and I'm a prophet and steward, aren't you a priest? What really is going on there? What the world? Right, right. And I might start I, talking about your family members. <laughs> I'm just right. keeping it real. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I just thought, you know, every time I would read through that passage, I would just, I always wondered why. Uh, and, you know, I guess, like you said, food for thought, but, how but if they you, call Jethro one name, and then they also called him by Raul. another name, Raul, yes. you get what I'm saying? So yes. I don't know if the, if the translation, you know, was she, you know, Cushite, and is this the same? We know that she's a Midianite, because that's what the, you know, scriptures plainly say, because Jethro is, but, but, but then why the, the switching of the name? But it's, yeah. For so here's the other food for thought. Whether she was a Midianite or Ethiopian, she was an African. Right. So oh, absolutely. both of those nations came, came, those nations came from the same continent. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I mean, I mean, in one even, context, perhaps, yeah. now I'm saying, it could be a whole different wife. I don't know. It doesn't yeah. say it's inconclusive. But I right. do know that whether it says Midianite, uh, Midianite or Ethiopian, in that same time frame, they were uh, from the continent of Africa and right. they would have had the same kind of skin color. Amen. And yeah. even when you talk about the Egyptians during the time of Moses, they were Africans. They don't look like yeah. the Egyptians today. Right. So we right. have to take the full understanding yeah. of where it came from and what we're dealing with. And then with the power and through the Holy Spirit, gather a deeper understanding. But either yeah. way, uh, again, it um, they were whether it was one or two women, they were both Africans, and yeah. they would have had a different skin tone than the uh, than the Israelis at that time. And just in a, what you said, it could have been when they started the journey. I had a different attitude, but when right. I become jealous of my brother, my sister, come on now, I've had people who who love me day one by day twelve. It ain't too pretty. I'm just saying. <laughs> Amen. Maybe none of you experienced that. I can only speak for me. And nothing about me changed. What'd you say, Krista? Go ahead. I still love you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And well, you've been other... with me more than 12 days, so I appreciate that. But I'm just simply saying that, you know, um, I have had people in my life, you know, my son is 31. And, you know, it probably looks a lot more like Jed and Krishna than he does me. And when people first meet me, they don't have a problem. But after a while, then they go start saying some crazy stuff. I'm just saying. <laughs> the the other thing I was gonna say um, was uh, uh, wasn't uh, Midian uh, a descendant from uh, Abraham's second wife, Qatar? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, so this is also tied in, of course, Abraham would have taught, or I'm sure they would have saw, would have seen um, circumcision and all that type of stuff. So possibly this is where that whole line comes down, um, you know, like in Exodus chapter three, which it talks about, you know, Moses was a shepherd, uh, father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. So, I mean, he's... You know, Jethro is clearly a descendant, goes all the way back to, um, um, goes back to Abraham's second wife, Qatar. Absolutely. So if the Egyptians are looking for people to come in, because again, it was an abomination for them, then yeah. they would have chosen them to come in yeah. and yeah. service the Hebrews. They would not have done it. Right, right. We're going to close here in a couple of minutes, but I appreciate what you're bringing, Quincy, and, and tying it back to Abraham. Um, you know, we'll end with this thought. Uh, you know, Paul in Ephesians 2, obviously, verse 11 and through 14, talks about the wall of enmity and hostility that exists between Jew and Gentile has been torn down by the blood of Jesus. And I think we can look and see the relationships. You know, Abraham enters into this covenant, causing it causes tensions in a, non, in a number of ways for the people of Israel and the nations surrounding them. Um, and, and here we have God working through the blood of Jesus, this plan of restoration and reconciliation. Um, because of who Jesus is, he kind of once and for all unites the Jewish world with the Gentile world through, through faith uh, and the covenantal purposes of God. But we're, you know, to your point, Quincy, seeing some of the uh, the carnal realities of these human relationships and political dynamics, family dynamics, jealousies, tensions, enmity, uh, playing out at, at this stage of the story, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, I will just close us off in, in prayer. It's 858 um, as we're ending another time. I just want to say I really uh, love and appreciate you guys. And I'm glad to be going on this journey with you and just looking at the Bible together and Appreciate everyone's perspectives and patience as we navigate the scriptures together and ask the questions. You know, we don't have all the answers. It's okay to ask any question. There's no dumb question. Um, mm. you know, we just need to be real and say, like, man, we just don't know. It's okay. God's really big. 
This story has been going on for thousands of years. And it's really safe to say, man, I don't know. You alone know, Lord. <laughs> and so to go back to his wisdom and to go back to the fountain of all truth is the goal, not to a human teacher. And so That's I appreciate definitely. asking all these questions and just diving in like this and looking forward to more to come. So um, I'll just pray and close this out. So Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. And we just come back to that bedrock truth that we don't we don't live by bread alone, but we we live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And you hold all things together by the word of your power. We breathe in air and breath because you gave us that breath. It comes from you. And one day the spirit that indwells us will go back to the one who created it. We will return to you uh, because all life comes from you. And all that we have comes from you. And so we give you thanks and praise uh, for all of the many blessings you poured out. And we just ask for the the washing of the word in our hearts today. So we've been studying the scriptures and talking about these things. We see in a mirror dimly. We don't perceive it all. We can't, our finite mind can't even contain it all or comprehend it all. And so we just ask for your help to wash us, to cleanse us, to give us that discernment that we've been talking about, Lord. If we're in, in the end times as we discern we may be and deceptions all around, that you would give us keen eyes to see, ears to hear, as uh, Sylvia said, we got to know. We got to know the difference between an orange and an apple. We got to know the difference between good and evil, so that we can be building our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. So, thank you for every uh, person on the call, everyone that's going to listen to this or watch it down the line. I want to just pray in the name of Jesus that you would secure us in your hands more and more, that we would walk with you in deeper and deeper intimacy, um, and that you would move in a fresh way in each one of our lives. Bless families represented here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We welcome you back next Monday, and we want to remind you that there are breadcrumb videos that are posted daily at tourofTruth.com. So Jed, Pastor Jed, Pastor Sylvia, and myself, we uh, facilitate those breadcrumb videos. They're just five to eight minutes or so, um, but they help with the reading um, that you're reading on the daily plan. So we just want to encourage you to, to find those if you want um, to have us with you on the journey through the week. And then otherwise, we'll see you back here next Monday. God bless all of you. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.